Welcome, everybody. Thank you for coming. It's a ton of fun to put on this event, and I hope everybody has a great time, it takes away a memorable experience, maybe learn something, and hopefully meet some contacts that are going to help you in life and maybe in your career. Um, I'm super happy to introduce our panel today to be talking about the maturing of meat and proteins. This is a topic that if you're culinarians, you've probably been watching pretty actively on Instagram because there's a lot of activity in the past couple of years, thanks to a new technology you're gonna learn a little bit more about today. So we've got a panel of experts here today. On my far right is Ariel Johnson, Dr. Ariel Johnson. So, <laughs> she's a PhD in flavor chemistry from Berkeley, was that? UC Davis. UC Davis. My brother's alma mater, so yes, great program. Um, she is the uh, scientist for NOMA projects, which is under development, as most of you know. Uh, Renee came out earlier this year and decided it's going to change. So Ariel is part of the, the team that is creating that change for the future of NOMA. So we'll be watching. Um, no pressure. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> Next to her is Heather Thomason from Philadelphia. Heather was a successful Mark Cheer. <laughs> and if, you, if you're a Philadelphian, you know Primal Supply, and I'm sure you know her uh, by reputation as a great person and somebody who is really trying to change the meat industry for the better by sourcing local, pasture-raised, whole animal, hogs, and stuff. Deer, <laughs> cows, beef, beef, pork, and lamb. Beef, yeah. pork, and lamb. Thank you. Yes, her product is beautiful. If you haven't had it or been to her shop, she's got two of them in Philadelphia. I highly recommend checking them out. They're beautiful. Um, and she is a meat expert. Nick, the meat man. Nick, that could be taken a few ways. Nick, <laughs> Nick Solaris is Instagram is one of my favorites, not only because he eats at every great steak restaurant in the New York metro area and beyond, but he also is a passionate BMX park rider <laughs> and uh, showing the teenagers the way it's done. So he's uh, he's a meat impresario, a writer, great um, blog. Instagram, social media under Meet Life. So check him out. My friend, Shola Olanloyu, who most of you know, if you're a chef, I'm sure you know Chef Shola's work, is one of the most influential chefs, two chefs in the industry with his renowned studio kitchen, Instagram. So Shola was the first chef ambassador user of Dry Ager in North America that I'm aware of. Anyways, first guy I knew that had one and imported it himself from Europe so he could begin to explore the technology that you're gonna learn more about today. And was our first and most obvious choice for a chef ambassador for the Dry Ager brand and is on the cutting edge of what flavors can be enhanced, improved and textures changed for the better by using this new technology. So I look forward to what you guys have to say and thank you all for coming. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all so much for coming and thank you. Um, I, I guess I'm technically the moderator of this thing, but um, you, you guys all have like really amazing things to say and perspectives we've already chatted about. So I think we're going to keep it as like organic as, uh, as possible. And um, to the audience, we'll do questions towards the end. So if you think of anything, um, you'll have a chance to ask it. Uh, so, yeah, I'm, nominally, um, this this panel is about the future of uh of dry aging, but I think, you know, if we're talking about the future, it helps to understand the uh, past and, and the present. Um, so maybe I'm, I'm interested in how each of you, uh, since you were all big fans of dry aging and big users of dry agers now, um, got into dry aging in the first place. You want, you want to start? Yeah, go ahead. Um, sure. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Uh, <laughs> I got into dry aging because uh, I work in whole animal butchery and ultimately it was inventory management, if I'm being totally honest. Um, so yeah, I have a butchery here in Philadelphia, um, but as long as I've been managing whole animal butcher shops, ultimately we're buying whole animals. And if someone does not buy your ribeyes, you're certainly not gonna turn them into ground beef. Um, so dry aging for me was actually a very practical way to ultimately stabilize for lack of a better um, 
term, the most valuable cuts on the beef. So if we didn't sell them immediately, we set them back on the shelf and let them age. And that bought us some time um, to be able to, you know, just like wait, build a market, turn it into something else. Um, so I started doing it, honestly, pretty wild west in walk-ins. Um, like I said, it was sort of out of necessity. I had some experience with curing meat, so I did try to start initially in like controlled, um, I was trying to do it in controlled units, but space became an issue. Uh, like I said, primarily we were uh, dry aging the larger, the higher value cuts. So you're looking at like whole bone in loins, um, even in like a small single door refrigerator, like you can fit three loins in there and then what? Um, so I started doing it in walk-ins um, and it was successful, but it was really, um, variable, uh, trying to sort of throughout the year and the season, humidity was my biggest enemy. Um, I don't know if you've ever tried to put a dehumidifier in a walk-in, but I can tell you it won't work. Uh, it will start to work and then it will ice over again and again. Uh, they're just not designed that way. I've even researched to look for ones that are supposed to work in lower temperatures. They don't. Um, so, you know, we did over years in different facilities and different walk-ins, um, doing my best to kind of learn and understand, uh, having humidistats on the wall so that we know what we're challenged with, um, bringing in fans and trying to create like airflow, like strategic rotation of the beef, trying to control mold and blooming when it happened. Um, you know, we were able to achieve something that was really, I mean, we're starting with really high quality product and what the results were interesting. They were usually good, um, but they were incredibly variable. So, I mean, all of you are chefs, you can understand this. My business is we, we do wholesale to restaurants, but we also do um, quite a bit of like retail butchery to, to home cooks. So much like you're doing in your restaurants, I'm trying to sell someone a great steak over the counter, have them have a good experience, come back and have that experience again. And that was just like pretty impossible. Um, so just the, there's already enough variation in what I do because pasture raised meat is consistently inconsistent. No matter how much you control the feeding and genetics, we, we have some predictability in our outcomes, but the, the product itself going in was inconsistent for that reason. Um, and then because of the ambient environment, it was even more so. So sometimes we're achieving, um, you know, it's like sometimes the moisture loss was moderate. Sometimes the flavor development was something desirable. Uh, like it got sort of a deep umami mushroom flavor. Sometimes it tasted like cheese. Sometimes it tasted kind of funky and rancid and things that you don't want to eat. Mm -hmm. So you've taken your really high valuable product. You've waited eight weeks for it to take up space. Uh, and then now it's like, you know, also the cost of it, everybody thinks they're going to make more. Um, you're not going to make more. All, you're, all people are paying for is the rented space and the, the loss um, between the moisture loss and the yield and the trim that you're going to lose on the outside. So when all is said and done, we're trying to recover our costs and still sell a great product to our customers. And it was really hard. Um, Thanks to Shola for discovering the dry edger units. Uh, I have now had dry edger units in my facility for two going on three years, I want to say. Um, and the shift from that into those units was game changing for us. Um, the control in those environments, primarily humidity was the biggest thing for me. The temperature control is great. Uh, the blue lights for bacteria and things like that all help. But the humidity, the humidity was key. Um, you know, we can manage less, like the over drying is as detrimental as too much humidity. You know, one is going to give you um, a product that's going to cook terribly. The other one's going to cause all the mold and blooming. So anyway, I could probably go on and on, but that's how I started. I and I do think I got pretty damn good at it, to be honest, um, with just trial and error and some loss. But now, uh, yeah, with this technology, it's like, it's, it's pretty amazing. I, I am a dry ager ambassador. I will shamelessly promote dry age all day because it is a really, really amazing, uh, amazing technology. So tell us about your experience. <laughs> so I actually got into dry aging because of a 1998, I believe, article in the New York Times about dry aging and about dry aged beef and how it was sort of this dying craft, right? And one of the few places that did it at the retail level was Florence Meat Market in the West Village. It's still there. They, uh, they have a, a really old... Can you hear me? Hello? Oh, sorry about that. Ooh, Jesus. Uh, so they have a really old school program. The guy swears that it must be hanging bee from Aurora, Illinois. You could never see a vacuum bag. We were talking about that earlier. And so I went there and I bought a steak. And I didn't cook it great because I didn't really know them much. But there was a distinct difference in the flavor of that and any other steak I'd ever cooked. Now, I'd eaten at all the steakhouses at that point in New York, so I was sort of exposed to dry aging on that ambient level in that most of the beef I was eating at steakhouse. Do you want to... It's, it's getting something to interfere with. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. 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 Let's just do that. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Sorry, I'll try to speak up. If you want to turn it off. How's that? Bye. No, I said bye. I wasn't being rude. Um, so I discovered this great difference. Fast forward about five or six years. I started something called a food blog in like 2005, but it was kind of this sort of nascent thing. And never with the intention of ending up on a panel with these fine folks and talking about beef for a living, but that's kind of what happened. And really, I really do think that dry aging is what got me here because the difference between dry age and what every other beef that I eat outside of the steakhouse was, was so profound that I just figured that there had to be other treasure troves to be discovered in the culinary realm. And of course there are. I mean, it's, you know, once you delve into this thing, it becomes addictive. Um, can be detrimental. I put on a few pounds during the time. But, <laughs> but getting up to where we are now, I became a Drage, Drage ambassador about a year and a half ago, two years ago, um, which was kind of my COVID pivot from like pure journalism to like working with brands and trying to make a living in, in the COVID world. And honestly, having the dry ager has been like an amazing experience because I get to apply all of the things that I've learned from working with chefs and being in all of the big dry age rooms, and the butchers and the steakhouses, and then seeing how you can really pull it down to the to the level of your kitchen. And then working with people in oh thanks. Then working with this is a test of stereo. Um, so what I thought, what it's it's gone the other way now because I work with this Wagyu importer and we ended up dry the Wagyu together. He was so impressed that he's now taken that to a commercial level. So the dry age just scales down, it scales up. What what, what can you say? Anyway, <laughs> what do you say? Um, you know, so for me it was kind of an interesting story. Uh, in you know, I found the dry age by sheer coincidence, and it's kind of a strange story that sounds so fake because I was actually literally driving from Vienna, Austria to Venice, Italy. So it was a six-hour drive. So, so I had to pass through Slovenia, and it was in the capital of Slovenia, Ljubljana, that I found a friend I was working with at the time. And he asked me to go to the second one. And I'm like, yeah, I'll be And I just put it on the plane, let's go. Seven days later, Elizabeth Seaport, and, uh, and I started experimenting. Uh, but the initial fascination is, you know, if, if you think of, of food and cooking, people people focus on specific parameters of cooking, but not the confluence of those parameters and what how it affects you. For example, someone sees, you know, temperature is the key to everything, but it is climate is the key to everything because temperature is a function of climate, which then adds humidity. And if you think of all the things that you eat in some context. Climate is important to how they develop into their flavor. If you have a fresh, soft, ripened cheese, it's just like a piece of cream. It doesn't have any flavor until you age it and it blooms in the right humidity environment. If you look at what initially we would consider a root cellar when you had the refrigeration of dry ages, root cellars were the best place to keep vegetables over the winter and store them. And so once you start to think about the power and importance of being able to manipulate climate. You know, the beauty of science is that you can go from humidity from 1 to 99% in very precise elements, and temperature from X to X in also very precise elements. And so it's kind of that due diligence of, you know, the most depressing people that people will see is, it's all been done before. It hasn't. It has not. It just has not been done specifically, precisely, with detail and attention to the results. That's why we like science. So if you start to think about the technology of dry aging and how you can, although I don't have examples of those things here today, over the years, some of the things, after being comfortable with dry aging meats and seafood to, to specific flavor or intent, there are a lot of other interesting things you can you can do with a dry aging that may seem silly, but when you do taste them, uh, I worked on a project with Wiley Dufresne where we made, and don't laugh, vegetarians, carrot pepperoni, which was just really large carrots, dry spice with pepperoni rub, vacuum packed, cooked to it till the inside, you have to use a probe, which is 85, that's, there's no longer rawness, and then it's done. You cool it, 
and you hang it in the dryer until it's like almost bone dry for about four weeks. And then it gets interesting. You rehydrate it in carrot juice, and then you dry it again, and you repeat that process four times. It starts to take on the texture of meat. It has the flavor of pepperoni. It slices like pepperoni, and you can put it on a vegan pizza, and it's fun. Sounds silly, but it's fun. And but that's the whole idea. Of, if you apply that process of dry it in my table to, for example, a beet aged and then rehydrated in beet juice, the, the whole idea of a beet steak, something that actually resembles the texture of beet, then becomes possible. Uh, one of the negative elements of refrigeration that we like to avoid is flavor transfer, which is generally negative. You know, if you had like something that you did not want to taste like onions, you would never put onions in your fridge. But if you think of the idea of how flavor transfers, for example, in smoke, you know, we, we deliberately transfer flavor. So if you listen to, I had this idea that when you age meat for a long time, they can speak to, to this. It starts to develop some of the lactic cheese flavors. That's quite a lot, please. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> See? And so I thought, why not actually just add the flavor of cheese to some other protein? And this is the idea of the, which is going to be the next book, the sacrificial cheese. If you in fact take, if you take a very pungent, soft ripened cheese, something like a Revlochon, uh, you know, uh, what's it, what's that cheese from uh, Jasper Del Fon, the really, wait a minute, the really funky strong ones, and you, you know, put it on a straw, straw mat at the bottom of the dryer jar, and hang like an entire pork loin, and age the pork one to six weeks, the pork will, will have a big When you saute it, it has a very complex, interesting, faint taste of the cheese without any physical contact between the two, just based on the aromatization of the two. Works with chicken, works with any protein that has any fat, because fat will absorb flavor. And so there's many directions to go in. Uh, you know, my ideas start generally on this one, but most of them work. <laughs> so I, I just have fun with it. Awesome, awesome. Well, I mean, something something I've been thinking about as you guys have been talking. Um, you know, obviously, cooks have always been interested in technology that makes cooking, uh, well, easier to do or easier control, easier to control or easier to uh, express themselves during the cooking process. But something I've noticed in the last like ten ish years is um, this interest in like techniques and technology that like bring this control of flavor um, kind of outside the bounds of cooking. So like I think fermentation, for example, has caught on a lot because uh, it gives a cook control uh, over the power to develop flavor um, before you're actually cooking the food. So it kind of expands, um, expands the limits of what you can do. Um, and, and Heather, I think you've been doing some really fascinating stuff sort of in that vein, uh, expanding, you know, uh, the point that we start thinking about flavor development from put, putting the meat into the dry ager to like well before that. And um, I would love for you to share some of those experiments you've been working on. Um, you're speaking to the feeding and breeding we yes, talked about? Yes, yes, yes. Sorry, if it's yeah, too oblique. Um, but. <laughs> yeah, so I guess... Um, yeah, the dry edger, just like by the time we get to that point, all it's giving me is is control. Um, but the product that we put into it is really where we focus. So what Ariel's talking about is that um, I've been really focused on with the partner farmers that raise for Primal Supply in developing uh, the meat that the meat that we're raising um, through feeding and genetics. Like we are really able to control the meat itself. Um, and keeping in mind that we're not sourcing feed, feedlot beef is controlled. <laughs> um, you know, that is actually something where like the animals, they're standing still, they're eating a very like calculated bowl of cereal every day um, and they are going to finish at a pretty precise weight with a pretty precise amount of uh, marbling intermuscular fat and it's very predictable. Like I was saying earlier, like we don't grade because it would be kind of a waste of our time because of the unpredictability of pasture-raised meat. If I was, you know, on the other side, like, uh, industrial producers are producing for 
an expected result, right? So I've been able to control that, though, to some extent, uh, the predictability by working with my farmers on the genetics of the beef and also what they're eating. Um, so again, a lot of this has been trial and error. Um, there have been times where we've had negative impacts from some of the changes that I've made. But um, you know, the farmer that I'm working with now, when I first met him and I was looking for somebody who could work with me at some scale to raise 100% uh, grass-fed beef locally, and by my sourcing protocol, the idea is that the animal should never eat grain, right? It's all about digestibility and gut health and, and health for the animal. And I do believe that, um, that, a, that a lifelong diet of grain for a ruminant animal is going to lead to poor health um, and, and in that poor quality in the meat itself. Um, so the thing that you can understand is that as long as they're not eating grain, what the grass is, is it's not just simply like putting them out to pasture. Because again, like we can't control nature. I mean, like it's 85 degrees in April. So what the fuck is going on anymore? Um, and we're also in the Northeast, like majority of people raising beef on pasture are not doing it in a place where the pasture is available 365 days a year. So what, what I've been doing with these farmers is that we're working on what our, um, forage is, and I talked about this briefly at lunch, the idea that we're seeding and growing grasses to then uh, cut into hay, haylage, silage, the edge on the end of that, meaning that those grasses are fermented, um, which, which uh, besides the byproduct of the, nutri the nutrient benefit to the animals, it's really for stability and storage that, they're, that that's happening. So what, what I've been doing with this farmer for a long time and the, and the sort of the story is that when I met him, um, he was someone who was an incredibly experienced farmer. He had the land, he had the knowledge, he had the herd to be able to, to raise beef at a scale for me. Um, he had recently converted to a grass-fed program by using what we call green corn. So the idea is that you can, you can plant, um, you can plant plants that would become seed. And if you harvest them before they go to seed, they are still grasses and then they are, they're therefore digestible to the animal. So you're not dealing with something undigestible, but you are, if you think about it, all of the nutrients that were going to go into that seed are in the plant, right? So they exist in the grass. So green corn is a really cool, high carbohydrate, high sugar way to give like to basically feed the beef grass candy <laughs> um, without giving them that undigestible grain. You can do it with barley, you can do it with other grains. So I met this farmer, he had recently converted to a grass-fed program using a mix of green corn uh, forage and the pasture, but he was using GMO corn. And for me, that's also a no-go. In our sourcing protocol, we don't, um, we don't allow for GMOs. Um, so, you know, we talked and he's like, hey, I have, uh, I have the ability to separate the herd. Um, you know, I have the infrastructure on my farm. I have a really nice uh, crop of alfalfa hay. What if I segregate it and I finish a small number of animals for you on the alfalfa hay and then they won't have any, they won't have the GMO corn and we'll work on this. I was like, that sounds fucking awesome. So, <laughs> you know, we shake hands, we make the deal, we start buying. Um, I was, and he did have some animals uh, uh, that that had not had the that were just kind of like clean and grass fed and we were buying those in the interim. Also, it takes two years plus to raise an animal to full weight on pasture. So this was like a long game. Um, and I effectively ruined the beef. Uh, my, <laughs> my like, what? Well, yes. Yeah, so I should note that like the, when I met him and I did try some of the green corn beef, the GMOs being the only problem, it was some of the best grass fed beef that I had ever seen or tasted um, in, this, in the sense that they were uh, incredibly well developed with intermuscular marbling and fat and they weren't lean. Um, and the flavor was the flavor was great. Um, so the beef that we were seeing over the course of the next one to two years as they were finishing on only that alfalfa hay, which didn't have the, the complex nutrients that they needed. There wasn't enough protein. There wasn't enough fat. Um, it got it just kind of leaned out in finishing and it really sucked. So so then we sort of go on for years. Um, this is I guess we've been working together since 2015. So it's been a while. Um, and slowly he started tweaking that mix. So we tried replacing the green corn with barley and it just didn't have enough high sugar content. So then he starts researching grasses. And ultimately, long story is that we have come back around to have a three part blend of two grasses and non GMO green corn that's giving us the protein the carbohydrates and the other nutrients that we need in this forage blend and these animals are finishing beautifully. The other part is genetics and genetics really do matter, especially for predictability. Um, the animals themselves will be, different breeds are genetically predisposed to their frame and carcass size, um, to the amount of, just like people, to the amount of fat that they might develop. Um, so the farmer that I'm working with has also primarily Angus genetics, but he believes in what we call hybrid vigor. Uh, I was saying it's it's not unlike if you breed dogs, um, that ultimately if you're always gonna have one, one breed, one type of genetics, 
over and over and over again, you are going to start, it's going to start to degrade, right? Like you're going to start to see um, genetic defects and some health issues start to emerge. So he's always wanting to cross something else in for the health of his herd, but we want it to be something that's going to give us what we're looking for in carcass quality. So when I first met him in those first few years, some of the breeds that he was crossing in, um, like Piemontese beef or the limousine beef, they're all a really large frame size, really large loin eye, which he thinks people want, but in beef, they were not just, they were not uh, genetically inclined to, to develop that intermuscular fat. So what we start seeing are these like larger frames with like really big lean loin eyes. Also not great for aging. Uh, the fat is like pretty, pretty crucial. Um, so over time, that's another thing that we've, we've um, done. So, you know, once I started seeing those finish, it's like, okay, the, the grasses are working, the diet is working, the breeding isn't working. So um, we eventually kind of settled into a more or less all Angus uh, program. And I was so happy. And just, I was, I was saying we're now at this like three year mark of a new genetic product project where we've been uh, crossing in these Akaushi beef. It's a brown Japanese cattle. Um, and it is, it does have a really large frame size. It's not necessarily a pro for me. Um, we're a small animal butchery. So hauling around thousand pound carcasses is like not awesome. Um, but these animals, uh, the Akaushi genetics is adding a, gen a genetic predisposition for incredibly uh, marble, marble beef. It's not going to look like a uh, Wagyu in the sense because so much of that comes from the production and the feeding of those animals to get what you all are probably thinking of as Wagyu beef. But when you take those genetics and you put them on grass and you put them into our program, what ends up finishing is but more or less something that looks a lot like a beautiful prime Angus. So, you know, awesome. eight awesome. years down the road of this, like, yeah. somewhat predictable <laughs> pasture-raised grass-fed beef. It's pretty cool. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, well, and, you know, for as spectacularly as dry aging works on beef, um, I, I keep thinking about this carrot you're talking about, Shola, <laughs> um, as well as the, like, beautiful chickens and pheasants you brought. Um, so, you know, be, beyond the sort of assumption that dry aging equals beef, um, I'm super interested in, uh, you know, some of the more underappreciated uses Stuff like that. Chicken is certainly seen as a basic animal to eat. It's uh, just like a menu food cost equalizer. But if you find great chickens, which is quite possible, and uh, treat them with uh, so you, this this last chicken I roasted, I don't know if anyone tried it, was actually kind of a revelation for me myself because it was actually aged by a carry here for eight days, and nothing was done, no prior treatment or rinse. Uh, it no, it's a pat dry, yes. internal cavity pat dry, right. and hang, and, and eight days. Eight days. And I didn't really modify it in any way other than season it with salt. Right. I use a fennel salt I make here, just really just salt, toasted fennel seeds, and fennel pollen in roughly equal amounts. So one thing I'll say is that those chickens were donated from Tartania. Yeah. They're the green circle chicken, they're right. a heritage breed chicken. And as the chicken dried, you could really see the beautiful, you know, if you dry each chicken that doesn't have a lot of fat, right. the skin will be see-through. Where this, as the fat was developing in the dry ager, it really beautifully concentrated. It was beautifully golden. You could tell that the chickens were taken care of. Absolutely. Okay. And, and then what happens, in fact, is after I roasted the chicken in almost like a two-step method, at the finish point, you could see the fat liquid actually bubbling between the skin and the meat. So in a way, it's almost like the skin stays crispy. It's actually confined itself with its own fat, schmaltzy chicken, you know, and uh, it comes out. And if you think think of all the effort it takes to get that, that texture on a picnic duck, you have to uh, steam it, brush it with bottles, hang it dry, maybe do that a couple of times, and then you actually get that glass-like, leathery, crispy duck skin. The same was achieved here simply by dry aging it. Didn't even use a comfy oven. This was just a regular oven. Uh, and uh, the important thing, though, and I think this is probably just an American thing, chicken is always overcooked here. <laughs> this was at the point where it was just past me. And I thought people would be horrified, but everybody ate it. And that, you know, I think uh, Helen can speak to it. You know, the sort of denaturing of uh, the actual blood and juices that sometimes it's still pink, but it's not blood, it's not, it's actually edible. So if you stop at that point, you know, the concern was that it would be too dry. It wasn't dry, it was juicy, it was great. Uh, I have a chicken that's been nine days yes. that I put in before Easter, and I just had, I, I had some lamb, I put the, I just, I keep all of my meat 
in the dry ager, if there's room, if I don't have a strip log hanging in there. Because, first of all, it's a meat fridge. So no matter what you do, it's not going to get the flavor of whatever else is in the other fridge. And it's a great way to prime things for cereal. Like chicken, I'll eat yeah. it just for a day. Just exactly. like, I don't know if Helen's here, but Helen Rosner was famous for using a Dyson hairdryer to dry out her chickens. Yeah. That's an effective way of doing it, but if you've got a dry agent, just stick it in the dry agent. It's more effective because you're pulling that humidity out in the correct way it's and getting rid of it. Right? Yeah. So yeah, my skin has gone from, it was it's a nice quality bird. It, it went from, you know, being quite light yellow. And now it's like, like burnt marigold and like fuchsia and maroon. It's like looking really, almost like you're um, like a pheasant out there. Yeah. Taking all these wild and I'll colors. talk about the pheasant. A minute. The, I guess, two or three more, most iconic roast chicken recipes in America would be either Marcella Hazan's chicken with two lemons and Judy Rogers' Sunday mm. Cafe roast chicken. I have one more. Yes. The Balthazar cookbook. It's mostly beef because it's literally a stick of butter in each breast. And then you swath it around, and then you literally sear it and finish it in the oven. In fact, I've just had an idea. I'm going to do that, but I'm going to dry age it with the butter in and just leave it for a few days to see if that works. And then Jonathan Waxman in New York City. In, uh, yeah, had a the, lemon, lemon, the lemon chicken. But can we talk a little bit more about the fat for a second? Because I'm super fascinated. Uh, also, we did eat the pork at lunch. Yeah. Um, what you said happened to the chicken fat sounds yeah. kind of similar to the change that happens in the pork fat, which is very different from how the beef... Uh, changes in the dry ager. Like the the beef is all, when you dry age the beef, it's very predictable, right? Like we know exactly what's happening. And there isn't really like, um, there isn't a much of a textural change in the beef fat, but the pork, when we dry age it, and I think that was about six weeks there, I noticed that the, um, there isn't a, as much of a shift in the flavor, uh, the complexity of the flavor of the pork meat itself. The fat is the biggest change. It, it turns it starts to turn into like a smooth, creamy texture as if you've cured it, although there's no salt involved. And I am not a food scientist, so I don't know why this is, but the behavior of those two proteins is wildly different. And it almost sounds like what happened to the chicken fat is more similar to what happens to the pork. Absolutely. I mean, part of the idea of, of, of doing the chicken that long was, so I was in Blue Hill two years ago for a month as one of the chef residents. And um, Dan Barber gets pheasants from Vermont. In fact, that is the same exact pheasant handed in there. It's from a farm called Woodbury Game Birds. I think they sell probably all of the pheasants to Blue Hill. And they age for six weeks completely intact. Nothing taken out of it except feathers off. That's it. And so at the time of butchering, when they serve it, they take out the entrails, you know, the organs, wash it and clean it. There's no aroma of spoilage. There's no effect to it. And that's, you know, to, to, to speak to the precision of the device in terms of maintaining core temperature and core humidity. Now, that's not something that you generally see. You know, pheasants obviously don't have salmonella. This is a very special farm with, you know, really precise practices in handling birds. I mean, they're shipped in, like, individual coffins, basically. Most of us will never get burials as good as these birds. <laughs> but they treat it so well, and that again speaks to like what you put in is what you get at. You just can't buy like you know you buy the acne, you buy agent. Really good. There's no okay. there's no like complexity of flavor to bring exactly. out. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> good things. Uh, agent uh, agent butter, which is a little bit because you have to have a dedicated dry agent to do it. Because butter does pick up all the flavors. So if you actually go through the process of making grass-fed butter by grass-fed cream um, uh, and, you know, culture it with something, whatever your culture starter is, for some period of time, um, whip it into butter, separate the butter mill, and then you have wash the butter, you have butter, you know, like you can wrap the butter, for example, in uh, fresh green fig leaves or wrap leaves, tie it nicely, like just like a cheese, like a banana, and just stick it in dry for five to six weeks. You know, like part of the difference between good butter and great butter is the residual moisture left in it. Those two to five to three to five percent less water left in the butter drastically changes the flavor. So if you, if you age butter that you made for some period of time, it just gets more intense, creamy, more cheesy, really complex, 
uh, anyone who's been ever lucky to either places like the French Laundry or like uh, Smith in Chicago, you see that they have the, those proprietary, proprietary very long age bottles that taste really nice. Yeah. In a little Washington, you know that. But that's what the dry agent does. It extracts moisture, which gives you a concentration of flavor, an improved sear, because the, the enemy of searing is moisture and water, right? So the less you have that on the surface, which is another reason if you have, even if it's a wet aged steak, season it, stick it in the dry age or overnight, it's going to sear way better than it would if you just got it out of the packet. Um, and again, I, I love it for just priming proteins. And maybe I'm going to try carrots now. If I agree. Really carrots, beans, pork. Yes. <laughs> the other thing I will say that I forgot to mention this is that the um, the drying process really changes in the dry edger as well. Um, you know, when we were doing it in sort of the wild and ultimately high humidity environments, the the purge that you see in the first like week to two. So, in my in my old old day Wild West uh, beef dry edging is you take a loin that's fresh, you're deciding to dry edge it. There is like a two week period where you can't touch that thing. Um, the, the, you know, it's like it's purging and it's, it's, it's like all of that is starting to, it has not formed a pellicle yet. It's like really sticky on the outside and, and that sort of, um, I don't know, like the moment where it kind of gets to that balance and it actually hardens and starts to dry was a period of time. That happens almost instantly in the dry edger. Um, we can take a loin and put it in there in like two to, two to three days we have, a, we have a pellicle and I never even saw that like kind of oozy, oozy weeping stage in between. Um, and then they very gently dry from that point forward. Um, we also see changes. I also didn't, in my older <laughs> version of this, I would say that there wasn't any notable change before four weeks. Um, just, you didn't really, you weren't going to notice like any, any change in flavor, any texture, breakdown in texture. And I think inside the dry edgers in two weeks time. Yeah, from, from a pellicle, that's the dryer was sold. Yeah. yeah. So, Might so, the most annoying thing I see in restaurant kitchens that I swear I'll never do, which is tie of 100 persimmons, individual in strings and hang them so they dry, making bushy gaggy. <laughs> <laughs> so you just put your persimmons in the dry edge and they'll dry. <laughs> nice. So, I, I, and, then it goes, you know. and then you have to worry about uh, uh, massaging it the right the right way. Um, I, I've, I've been being signaled a little bit, so I think we are sadly almost out of time, but um, I wanted to see if there are any uh, questions for the panel. Um, I guess I'll give you you can just ask. Yeah, go ahead. Heather, so yeah. what are you currently doing? You know, when, you, when I've dry aged beef in the dry aged before, the trim has, um, it's so much, it's still leather, but it's not moldy, it's not funky. Are you using any like, bone and rye products, or do you have any practices currently with all of your dry aged trim? Like last year at the Philly Chef Conference, um, we tried uh, lots of different verticals of dry aged beef. And I made a uh, dried beef garum out of all of the trim well, of it. It was like super umami. It already had started the process. It was amazing. But are you using, are you finding any, like Shola and I spoke before about because it's dry aged, but because it's so controlled, Shola said you can make bolognese from the trim because it's treated so well and it's dry, but it's dry and flavorful. Are you doing it that? Um, so in my world where I'm almost always dealing with raw product, I do still have to be really cautious of bacteria. So we will create, um, we, we will produce dry aged ground beef uh, from, from the, the cuts from trimming a loin like that as a steaks. We do still try to carefully discard all of the like exterior pellicle layer um, because even the smallest amount of that being introduced to the raw grind can cause bacteria problems later. Um, but the amount of trim is like so minimal. Uh, it, it is a lot cleaner. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm a fan of all of that and I do like to use it, but like, we're not, I'm, I'm not a chef. That's not what's happening in my, in my facility. So we're trying to use them into sort of secondary use raw products and we have to be careful about the contamination. And I would still advise you to do that. Yeah. When I did, I took all of the trim and roasted it really, really heavily. Yeah. I mean, caramelized it. It wasn't a raw norm. It was like super, it was like au garm. Yeah. I mean, even just pre making like brats yeah. or demis out of that would be incredible. Yeah. Well, I mean, getting, getting to, like, it, obviously, a dry aging, you'll lose money, but you do gain some things. You gain bones, you gain things that you can actually you And let me tell you something, dry aged bones, making stock with dry aged bones mm -hmm. is phenomenal. Like, mm -hmm. you're getting depths of flavor there that you just won't get from fresh beef. I agree. Do we, uh, any other, any other questions for this great uh, group? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, how about uh, dry aging super show? Have you done yeah. anything? I mean, yeah, so, um, uh, yeah, you know, a lot, obviously. Um, the 
the I, I find generally that the fattier fish at best dry age can survive some period of time to generate like you know easily discernible flavor difference. You know, uh, salmon works great. Uh, Spanish mackerel works great. Uh, the best fish to dry is your turbo, you know, which is already like super gelatinous. You know, it's kind of like roasted turbo that's been dry aged. It's like fish creme brulee, really. <laughs> Very crispy, uh, uh, incredible, delicious. Um, scallops are great um, because, um, you know, again, things that come out of the marine environment that are intact in their largest possible form. If you want to dry the scallops, I'd get like U10 or bigger so that you can have some mass. There's no real trim waste. I think within a three to seven day proper climate agent, uh, you won't lose any weight. I mean, you won't lose any mass of fish, maybe a little bit of weight loss, but definitely a quantifiable significant flavor improvement just from a simple sale with salt and nothing else before you can decide on how to go. Now, sometimes you see, what, one of the benefits of kind of a dry agent is if you're doing complex seafood dishes, like seafood dishes that involve sort of terrestrial proteins, you know, like if you roast a scallop on top of it, like a butter made with tuduya, for example, you know, the pork may want to overwhelm the seafood, but this way they balance it away. And, you know, some of the media fish, you know, you could, uh, I'm not really the expert in dry Asian fish, you know, but my friend, Lee Wei, if you, if you look on uh, Instagram at dry aged fish guy in Los Angeles, Lee Wei Liao, and myself both worked with uh, origin salmon, and he has done all the extensive experiments on temperature and humidity for aging fish. He's also a dry agent He's a very informative source on aging seafood. Did I see any hands back there? Are there any? Uh... Yes. Huh? Okay. The same application of butter where you're wrapping butter in big leaves. Yeah. Um, could you do the same with a solidified fat, like duck fat or like schmaltz? It's, I haven't tried it, but it's possible. Fats will have dog flavor. I Plus kept up. a 40 pound box of beef tallow yeah. in my dry agent for a long time. I can't say I was getting a discernible flavor because I was roasting potatoes and deep frying in it. But it's certainly a good way to keep it. I mean, it was, hmm. Does, there have, does it have to be moist, moisture to lose, too? I mean, yeah, well, there yeah, is a fat that's going to have You're not going to lose it. Right. Yeah. And, and, I'm, and I'm also wondering, I mean, I would just. I would assume, just based on, I don't know, my brain. Um, that, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. But the, you know, the, the, the back catalog of information that like you probably get quite different results doing like a melted and rendered fat versus like fat, you know, still with like the cellular structure yeah, intact. Totally yeah. Different. And that's true because, you know, the intent of doing that to butter is to serve it as table butter. You know, suddenly, you know, uh, Infusion, which is what you're speaking to. I could melt butter through fig leaves, fig leaves into it, let it mm. simmer, and then pour it back into a mold. But the texture of that will not be butter, it'll be solidified, clarified butter. Mm -hmm. That's the whole difference. So yeah. with, with fats, I don't think the texture of fat changes. If I wanted to make aromatized duck fat, I'd just melt the duck fat with like star in its clothes and bay leaves in it, let it simmer for an hour. You know, sometime I'd melt and just strain it up. Yeah, and I think, like in terms of flavor formation, having like the little the little bit of like minerals and mineral containing proteins that it's in like the, the the water part of meat is like pretty important for making any changes to like the fat molecules yeah, it would themselves. Be, uh, it's more I think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But if you, if you, for example, one thing you have done, if you age duck legs really strongly, and then make by strongly you mean like by like longer time and way longer than is necessary. <laughs> just, like, just to be clear, yeah, yeah, yeah. Three, just for days. Mm -hmm. unless of course you're going to make confit with it, and then when you confit it, it will become again actually edible and like tender, mm. and you can actually get super crispy confit. Mm -hmm. But then the duck fat that you use to you know cook it mm -hmm. is much more incredibly flavorful, That's and that I have whipped into like just like kind of like what Brad did with the, the toast with yeah. the yeah, like awesome. kind of like duck fat lime. Yeah. Yeah. So that's another way to get to the idea of what you're talking about. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, yes, ma'am. Is it just like a set it and forget it, or do you have to control any variables, or is it just the whole point is just put it in there? Yeah, it has a microprocessor. You can
you know, one of the one of the best things about Brian that I don't think is spoken enough about that makes the technology accessible, you know, one, it's a 120 volt device. Number two, generally, historically, all of this kinds of devices, I remember when I was looking for an aging cabinet, the, the number one choice at the time was Stagionella from Italy, but it requires a water connection to generate the humidity. Mm. And the Germans solved that problem, which is a very important solution, because mm. that's just a $5,000 addition to the cost of the and I can keep mine in my yeah. living room, which exactly. I can never do if, if I needed a water. No water connection. And it's pretty yeah. amazing. Like, yeah. I put in Wagyu, which has very high water mm -hmm. content. Um, and then I put in, like, two other things. And there's a pan in the bottom. Um, and what, what do you call it? The flavor with the... Salt blocks. The salt blocks. The salt blocks yeah. cool. But the pan is really designed to collect water. Yeah. Maybe I've had to empty it once. The first week, you might have to empty it. After that, it almost... It, it's such a controlled environment that it really... The, you get spaces almost immediately. Yeah, we don't do any water maintenance on our yeah. units. Ooh, and yeah, you can definitely, like, like my units are all set for raw meat, so like we're holding it at refrigerated temperatures and a fairly high humidity, and if you wanted to transition to like a charcuterie program, you could absolutely reduce the humidity, increase the temperature. Yeah, really programmable. It's pretty cool. Though, right? Which has... There will be a new unit coming Right, because the, the, the one I have, a, I have the U, uh, UX 500. Yeah, you've got the residential. So that gives you humidity control, temperature control, but you set it manually. But it's, it's, very, very, it's, it's, very, it's very precise. Mm. When you open the door, you'll see it change. But In the first days of using the dry jet, when I was still somewhat paranoid and dubious about technology, because <laughs> I was like putting like $2,000 <laughs> into this thing, and like, this going to go bad. So funny enough, I went on Amazon and I bought one of these wireless temperature and humidity mm. sensors that you just put inside, mm. turn it on, connect the I love to your Wi Fi, oh. and then you can check the dryer on your food anywhere you are in the wall to make sure it's at the same temperature. If not, an alarm goes up and you can run, drive back to you, <laughs> you fix it. But yeah, I think the new models will have sort of more stringent controls. I've never had any problem with it. This is a mm. super OCD. Compensation, but they're essentially easy to use. There's no real requirements. I think the book seems to have a, a, a try to establish protocols for temperature and uh, humidity for various. Uh, well, the unit, yeah, Ooh. the instructions actually yeah. have pork, what Ooh. you should you know, the ideal. But, but and I, so, sorry, I hate, I, I hate, absolutely hate to do this. I think we are at the mercy of the schedule. Maybe we can uh, si sidebar it, but. Um, yeah, thank you guys so much. I've learned so much today. Um, I wish we could do it for longer. Thank all of you. Uh, yeah, and uh, thank you, Mike, and the Philly Chef Conference.